while recording the series, a big balance update came out, overhauling one of the warrior lines, arms. I've not fully looked into that yet, but today I want to run over what is my favorite way to play warrior as far as open world PvE is concerned and story missions. And there's a big decision right at the start here, as we've had with so many of these professions. Which elite spec do you go for? Hell, even Core Warrior is pretty good. I've gone with Spellbreaker. Now, I know there's some big Berserker fans out there, and it's definitely true Berserker has the higher burst damage and more situational quick wins. And it's very true that quite often in Guild Wars, if you just burst something down fast enough, it's often the easier route. But overall, I think Spellbreaker is the much better generalist and usually those are the builds that I find myself having more fun on that has more quality of life, more options available to you and overall is more applicable to more players. So that is what I'm going to be recommending. Let's get to a montage and see how the build is performing and then we'll run into exactly how to do it. Let's play Spellbreaker. Opening up first of all with a Heart of Thorns hero challenge as I often like to demonstrate on these videos. I went with the Chuck Blitzer this time. And I tried to aggro it in a scenario where there were a lot of other, you know, enemies and things around too. The point here is that all of these hero challenges are meant to be group content and we're going to solo them and see how comfortable we can. I think one of the other builds I demonstrated this on was actually the Tempest and I found it much easier on the Warrior. Here you'll actually see I'm continually being attacked by the little Zapper off on the side, which I think is one of those targets you have to kill through break bar damage and even with him just pew pew pewing which is some pretty substantial damage we're fairly okay at just breaking through this guy again we do get pretty fast packets of damage on this build so retaliation is quite dangerous uh, but if we break the bar it shouldn't be too bad for contrast here's a path of fire hero challenge which I don't usually show because these are designed as solo but a bit of uh, perspective for you all you can win at one of these hero challenges. This is like the design arena net wants you to go for in just a combo or two. Here's probably what the tankiest hero challenge in Path of Fire. And it's this guy that will attempt to CC you off this mountain top over and over and over again. I just wanted to show how quickly you can kill this guy and easily. I've definitely been here during the Path of Fire days trying to kill this dude and I fall off and then he combat breaks and then I've got to get, get back up. Well, on Spellbreaker, you always tend to have some evade or some way to get out or some kind of crowd control, particularly on the build that I'm going to be showing you guys. You have already seen one little bit in the footage that is annoying about Spellbreaker and that's missing your full counters. I'll explain in just a moment. But uh, we did have kind of an annoying one there on uh, the footage for this. Here over to the Balthazar boss fight. I mean, come on, we're a warrior. We are uh, Balthazar's favoured, at least as far as Guild Wars 1 was concerned. Let's see how we feel fighting him. Uh, this is actually a boss I tested a ton when building this. And a lot of my comparisons with Berserker versus Spellbreaker took place here. Uh, the thing with Berserker is you can actually kill Balthazar really, really, really quickly once you've min-maxed the fight and you know all of his animations. What I want you to pay attention to is how rarely he actually gets a single hit on us. Every time he does some kind of ground target animation, we just full counter it. Over and over and over again, we can freely and comfortably full counter. I very rarely have to spend any endurance, of which we get heaps of, just because I can keep my... Uh, tempo up and my momentum going by instead hitting full counter and you know actually trading a bit of damage out and continuing to proc various traits over and over and over again in fact we can do the entire boss fight in this way sometimes he will get through and that's just poor play from me but it's not punishing because we heal up ridiculously quickly on this build or can just dodge spam around some of the other times you see i get hit is just simply we're phasing him you know we're not using the mission specific weapon for this and we're phasing him quicker than probably that weapon often would allow you to you've got plenty of cleave damage so when these uh, hammers come up which you're supposed to uh you know knock out you can do in just a couple of hits when orin gets attacked and chained up just a couple of hits and that mechanics done and most of the time we're waiting around is when he's invuln at every what is it 20 percent health threshold or 25 percent health threshold this is just a really really fun fight on spellbreaker it's so fun i get so much endorphin release just from hitting full counter every time he's got some kind of big thing coming up and then go into the weapon swap for the next big uh, animation so yeah being able to juggle all this stuff keep all the adrenaline you could possibly need uh, I think this is an absolutely brilliant demonstration. There is actually another big Balthazar oriented bit of content in the game. I'm also going to show you in this montage that's, uh, as it turns out, a lot harder than this final boss battle. Uh, but I guess we'll see in a second. So there you go. That's how uh, we do with Balthazar. Over to the Flame Gin test. 
I actually think I'm going to kill five flame gin at once on this one. Let's watch the footage closely. We've aggroed four, and I think I aggro a fifth through the wall, the actual next packet. This guy's going to come in. Can you see there? He's looking at us. I think he might move in. Again, full counter allows us to sustain very well. Now, this one's actually quite tricky because that torment will keep lingering on us. And if we aren't uh, smart about where we stand and how we try to cleave, it could be a real problem. The idea here is that full counter is going to be chunking all their break bars down together. And we want to make sure that, you know, that they do actually go down and the stuns go in and we get the big damage modifiers later. There you go. Yeah, the fifth guy comes in, I guess, a little bit late. It's mostly a 1v4 there. Uh, this is a little bit deceptive. Some of the other builds that I've shown you on the series are better at killing these guys. There is actually a lot of thinking as I play here about exactly where I stand so that I avoid their fire lines and whatnot. And it's not all about the build there. Uh, many of the builds I'm trying to show you make uh, PvE as comfortable and fluid as possible. And still against the Flame Gin, it's, it can be a bit of struggle on this build, so be cautious there. Here I also want to show you what it's like just running around killing loads of things. There, there is that other Forge base which I showed with the Guardian video, but since we already did this, I thought I'd show off one of the early ones. This is just in the first map. And uh, you can see, you know, a ton of Forge come at us and we uh, take them down fairly comfortably. This guy taking a bit longer to kill just because we miss, again, another full counter. Uh, there's a big discussion I'm going to have on that in uh, just a moment. Obviously, I want to show you the Pocket Raptors from Heart of Thorns. Well, you're a big tanky warrior with lots of armor value, lots of health. And with all the supplementary stuff from Spellbreaker, it's really not a problem. You build 25 might very quickly. Look how quickly this veteran dies too. Just a couple of animations. And uh, he goes down with all the Procket Raptors near him uh, dying at the same time. You saw a really nice juicy dagger fall there, which is a weapon I truly adore in PvE. And then finally, the other bit of Balthazar content. What about the Heart of Thorns group challenge to kill Balthazar? Now, aside from soloing the group meta events, I'm pretty sure this is the hardest thing you can possibly try in open world Heart of Thorns. And I think there definitely are some builds that can take it out if you're completely min-maxed and tailored to this engagement. The difficulty here is mass ground AoEs, which if you're limited on range, which this build admittedly is, you're going to struggle with. Uh, the two Hounds of Balthazar you need to kill. Frequent break bars you need to get through. And insane auto attack pressure from the boss himself. So, uh, and you're kind of on a time limit because he does have a massive nuke ability that uh, maybe you can break the break bar and interrupt every single time, but it comes up quite regularly. So here you'll see I need to like try and resustain every now and then. And I'm not actually going to be able to beat this. But I did want to show you that fairly comfortably we can get about halfway all on our own. There you go. There's his big nuke and there wasn't actually a break bar with it. But I thought that would be kind of fun. There you go. That's the montage. That's the Spellbreaker build. Hopefully it looks entertaining. Let's see how we run it. All right, so let's see exactly how it's working. A little note as well, the most recent patch, as I record this, added build templates to the game. So hopefully I'll have a code for you guys. I haven't really messed with the system just yet, but uh, hopefully I'll have a code for you guys that actually gives you the build itself and you can copy it in. But nonetheless, I'm going to run through, tell you every little bit of uh, what I'm running and why, and we will go from there. So like I said at the header of the video, there was an arms rework recently, which has some interesting new traits. There's like some big modifiers for hitting targets with barrier and whatnot. And to tell you the truth, when it comes to Path of Fire content and beyond, there is actually a lot of barrier and there is a lot of application for some of the stuff that you find there. But I'm still going to stick with the big three that's strength discipline and spellbreaker and what i've gone with here anyone who plays a lot of pvp will actually recognize is kind of a staple over there with some slight tweaks uh, i do believe that this combo gives you such a ridiculous amount of synergy through the boon might that it's brilliant in terms of how versatile it is. You're gonna solo power yourself up massively. As we know in these builds, it's always important to get very high might and very high solo fury and quickness if possible. That's something that this build excels at, as well as giving it lots of healing and lots of dodges kind of whatever you need to get through. So uh, yes, and then the weapons themselves as well, there's quite a few options for you, but my absolute favorite right now is gonna be Mace Axe followed by Axe Dagger. So let's start off, I guess, with the weapons and why we've taken that. Uh, so first of all, you've got your Axe Dagger set. This is kind of your big damage set. 
You give yourself your fury. You've got a little bit of range from throw axe, which don't forget recently became an ammunition skill and does massively increase damage the lower health your target is. Look at that, 100% more damage if they're below 25%. Uh, and then with the dagger offhand, while you can't really run this in some other formats, it's not that great. For open world PvE, I think it's really good. Uh, you've got the skill 5, blade storm, which you can obviously cleave and do lots of damage to lots of targets with. But also Wastrel's Ruin. Strike your target and do more damage to anyone not using any skills well on this build you have lots of ways of stunning or incapacitating a foe meaning you're guaranteed to get the double damage from wastrel's ruin this skill is actually one of the most ridiculous skills in the game in terms of straight up damage it's baseline hit without any might or anything is reading at 1500 for me here and if i hit someone not using any skills that will double up to over 3k so i can simply Bulls Rush, Wastrel's Ruin, right? And you saw we already hit over 11. And that's before we do any ramp or anything, right? This skill is truly nuts on just a 12-second cooldown. The way that you play Warrior, you probably swapped off of this weapon set before you get a second one up anyway. But you can get back to it very quickly. So, uh, basically, you can look at this set here as big damage and also resustain well, in terms of health. We'll look at that with our uh, traits in just a second. And the other set is big spike damage and also break bar stuff. So here we have our mace skills. Now, the one and the two, we don't actually care that much about. The auto takes, it, it's got good damage on the third, pul pulverize, and the weakness is all right. But realistically, we're not really auto attack chaining with the mace here. Realistically also, we don't need to use the block counter blow on mace that often. We use full counter when we see that there's an attack coming at us. So don't worry too much. But the crowd, the CC, the break bar damage from a quick little pommel bash, and the F1 skull crack is fantastic. So you're going to throw lots of these little skull cracks out to get through break bar damage. Or to again lock someone down. You get adrenaline, you skull crack, weapon swap. And once again you can wash those ruin for example. So that's why I have mace on the main hand. You could if you really want not to use mace main hand. But you can put another dagger on. You can go dagger main on this set and dagger off hand on the other. So this variation is dagger axe and then axe dagger. If you do this version, it's kind of a similar thing where you've got your quick little CC here. Basically like Mace F1, as long as you interrupt, right? So this is a stun for a second and a half if they're using a skill. So it's kind of uh, better in a way because it's quick. And then what you also get for while you're running around is the Dagger 2 and the F1, which allow you to just kind of run around a bit more, break combat, and get on your mount a bit quicker. So this feels fine. I like the Dagger main. It also got a bit of synergy with the traits. But overall, I've actually been enjoying Mace. So this is kind of your main choice if you really want one. Uh, and then you've got the Axe offhand, which basically you're just going to use the 4 to give yourself a ton of quickness, and the 5 to blow something up. Look at that. 15 packers of damage at 8,500 You've just locked someone down, say, with the F1. There's lots of cleave on this. That's kind of the way that you work. You're just going to be full countering, exhausting your uh, F1s, and swapping backwards and forwards. Uh, you do keep charging using these F1s and the full counter as much as possible because it's going to help with one of your Grandmaster traits in a second. So that's the idea of your weapon skills. Uh, let's look at utilities. So what I'm running is Healing Signet for the heal. Uh, this is just continual resustain that you don't have to stop to actually press. As always in PvE, I like to just be able to keep running along and just keep hitting things. And one of the big things about this build is it's constantly regenerating health through a ton of different means. Heal Signet is one of them. Uh, you'd very rarely activate it uh, if you have a lot of Condi on you, maybe. But that's the way I like to play. There are other valid heals. The Spellbreaker heal, for what it's worth, is immense. It's a truly epic heal. And even though it's taking boons off of you, like stripping all of your might and whatnot, you do add those boons back to yourself very, very, very quickly. The main reason I don't like this too much is I actually find it's overhealing. The uh, number of times you're going to be as low as like 8,000 health before finally triggering it and getting max value out of it uh, is kind of irregular. So this is just my go-to. The other really nice one is Mending. It has a trait synergy we'll look at later, but it's also good cleanse. So you can run around and just quickly hit Mending. It will recharge ridiculously quick. It will give you your trait synergy, which is actually going to bump your damage. So the two I would go between is either Mending or Heelsig, but I prefer Heelsig just for that extra passive play where you don't have to worry about interacting with this much and all your damn all, all your focus can be just be doing the damage um next i've actually taken a signet to improve my precision obviously if you build your gear and so on 
that you're already at 100% crit chance without the need of this, then go ahead. I very rarely actually press the Signet of Fury, even though it's really strong when you trigger it. It gives you extra ferocity and stuff. I just kind of leave this on here um, and call it a day. Then I have Bull's Charge for a trait synergy, uh, for an extra evade, and for a hard CC. This is one of the most loaded skills in the game. You can, If you see that there's a big dangerous thing coming at you, you can just Bull's Charge. In that opening clip section, I showed you, say, the Balthazar battle. I would Bull's Charge when I see a Balthazar attack coming sometimes. Knowing that I'd get an evade out of it and I would be fine. This guy's actually blinding us, which is pretty funny. Wow, and we got no crits. So, uh, I really, really, really like this skill. The trait synergy on top is nice. But even uh, above all, one of the things I actually most value about this in open world is using it to move around. Like, this is the thing when I was saying with dagger. I like to just be able to bulls charge to get away from a target or to just get moving so that I can get immediately on my mount and move on again, right? Just having that extra, like gap creator or just keep going keep going keep going feels good to me and similarly that's why i have stomp as well so i do believe in having a stun break it feels really bad in pve where you can't stun break if someone hits you if someone actually gets through your defenses you want to just be able to get straight back in the action and that's what i use stomp for um a lot of uh other areas of the game you want a stun break to not lock you into an animation because you want to use some kind of big hit of your own and stomp's generally not that good if you're going to stomp as a stun break you're also locked into this long slow thing right which kind of sucks but for pve it doesn't suck at all you can just stun break and look it's more movement and it's more break bar damage you can uh do a very big launch even an aoe launch here i would be cautious about spamming this i think a lot of you guys when you start trying my build here you're going to run in and stomp on the engage. Don't do that too much because you do want to actually kill things with melee. And one of the things you're limited with with Warrior is not having that much range damage. Quick comment here. You could fill your stun break. Instead, use Frenzy. That's obviously more quickness for the build, which is great. It's a ton of might too, but it's kind of overcapping on might. But when we look at the trait synergies, you'll see you get value out of might even if you're already at 25. So Frenzy is also very good. I just think stomp's a little bit better in terms of having that movement on there and the break bar and you know the might is already kind of covered uh and then finally for the elite i've got signet of rage you could run rampage if you like you could run the bubble if you like you could run battle stand if you like this again though it just helps you to build that adrenaline to keep using your f buttons make sure full count is always there i very rarely activate this you don't need to activate it for any of the three boons that you're getting from it just let it passively roll around and uh, in that way, again, you can just keep focus on churning your damage out. So I do want to touch a little bit on that range thing. This is one of the uh, biggest things, I think, that distinguishes Warrior from all the other builds that I can show you in PvE in the game. In my opinion, Warrior doesn't really have a great ranged weapon set for PvE. It only has two ranged options out there. It's got the longbow... And it's got the rifle. We might see with future elite specializations that expands or something. But right now with just those two, both of them are kind of slow, CG, kind of clunky, more 2012 feeling weapon sets. And you can definitely get by. Obviously, it's open world. You can get by with anything. But they just don't feel as good as getting into melee and supplementing your defense or whatever with the spellbreaker stuff. So uh, I'm actually on a double melee set. And that does change the way that we play Warrior quite a lot. It feels worse to have to be forced into melee, honestly. But uh, that's kind of my opinion about the rifle and the longbow. They just feel a bit slow and they're not really that interesting to me. That, again, is kind of the new arms rework stuff aside. Because I think there is a trait in there that augments them in some way. So we'll see. But there you go. Okay, so that's the weapons. That's the utility skills. Uh, let's now run on into the traits and see what we've picked. You're going to see that a lot of the Chronomancer build that I showed you, this has a big, like, through line that synergizes around one particular idea. And that, in general, is might. So let's start off with uh, Spellbreaker, which I think um, will give us the hook for the whole thing. First of all, you're going to be getting access to the dagger and full counter which is AoE days, is AoE damage, and is uh, sustain for you, some stability, or it just deletes some kind of attack that's coming at you. You do want to use full counter very regularly, and you get access to the daggers. So for the first selection here, you get kind of two utility selections, protection after you full counter, 
or whenever you do a daze, it's going to emote. And don't forget, all your full counters are dazes, and your pommel bash is, is uh, a daze as well. Uh, so you could run these, but in general, you don't need them. You don't need their quality of life. I would actually recommend Pure Strike instead, which just turbocharges your critical hit damage. All right, It's 7% increased critical hit damage, 7% increased ferocity. But if your target has no boons, it's 14%. Guys, a 14% critical damage modifier? on an adept slot is insane and here's the thing in pve there's not actually that many boons running around yes in new expansion content there are more and especially for pof when you're fighting stuff like the awakened you will find more but that means that when you take this back to earlier stuff especially vanilla it will completely annihilate everything in fact i don't think at any point in this video i've shown you any vanilla content trust me stuff like pure strike just goes ridiculous in vanilla and uh you really won't worry about uh having to do damage with something like pure strike it's just so so strong it'll be kind of weird to take any of these utility choices next our uh cc's remove boons that will help in those situations where there are some boons against you in later areas of pve such as where we are right now for our next slot, we kind of have three utility choices. Uh, the more aggressive of them is loss aversion, which is doing unblockable damage whenever you remove a boon. So that means because of this minor trait, Dispelling Force, whenever we like full counter or whenever we do any kind of CC, we remove boons. And now we're also getting loss aversion. And the loss aversion damage is good. It's one of those traits that does damage and can never crit. So when it says 636, it's pretty much always going to be around there. It will get modified by my... So this is good. And if you are sure that you're going to be going against enemies with boons, I definitely think this is an okay choice. Uh, slow counter I wouldn't worry about too much. It's very good for break bar drain. It means that full counter will be applying cripple and slow. But my favorite all-rounder is actually sun and moon style. Uh, so this is your dagger trait. And it says gain bonuses for each dagger you equip. If the dagger is in the main hand, then any interrupts you deal will apply you quickness. And if it's in the offhand, this is the bit we really care about, we're going to heal for a percent of our outgoing critical damage. So we've made the build so that we have a 100% crit chance at all times. That means that every strike we do, we're constantly resustaining and healing, right? And that's one of the heals that's going to be compounding with heal signet. So this is very, very, very nice. What it means is you'll notice, going back to our weapons, we are an axe dagger offhand. So it's on this setup. It's when we have the fast axe auto attacks with our dagger offhand. This is when we're healing really heavily. And you'll see as I strike this warg, you're constantly seeing green numbers underneath me, right? We need to take a bit of damage. So here, you see all these green numbers? Look, just all these crazy green numbers constantly coming up. Look at my health. It just will not go down. All I have to do is just keep autoing this. I don't even have to auto this guy, really. Uh, we're just going to be very, very, very sturdy. And that's one of the things that I have to impress upon you guys about this build. How heavily it resustains. It's got straight up tankiness. And if you're in some kind of like 1v1 PvE scenario, trust me, you're really not going to have to worry. Because your health is just going to be rocketing back up all the time. So pairing the really fast, really meaty axe main hand stuff with the dagger in the off is excellent for Sun and Moon style. I did already point out that if you go dagger main hand on the other set, well... Uh, that gives you that extra synergy of a bit more quickness on the build. It means when you use your dagger three successfully on that other set, you will give yourself quickness. Or when you bulls rush on the other set, you can give yourself quickness. Or when you full counter on this set, you can give yourself quickness. So dagger main, that's one of the big things about going dagger main hand on the other set. But I still really like mace. I think mace feels very, very good. Having both the skull crack and the pommel bash to quickly take a full break bar down. As opposed to dagger main where you just really have the one stun. Which can sometimes whiff. So, uh, yeah, Sun and Moon style, really, really, really nice. Don't uh, look past it. That resustain is crazy. Next, we get Attacker's Insight, which is whenever we disable someone or remove a boon, we get this modifier that just keeps building and building and building. Uh, it also means that when we successfully full counter, our F1 comes back. And that's actually kind of big. If you look back at my Balthazar fight, you'll see I, like, eviscerate Balthazar. And then I full counter an obvious attack from him. I'm not going to have the adrenaline to do this because this thing's going to die too quick. Th then I'll full counter an obvious attack from him. And then I will eviscerate him again. All right. And just being able to continuously do that. Or if he's got a big break bar, you can skull crack, full counter skull crack. Right. And now you can see suddenly where so much more stun damage comes when you're against a break bar. 
as opposed to if you were running da dagger main hand. Being able to back-to-back -back skull crack like that is kind of really awesome. Uh, so that's really what's good about this. And basically, it just means as the fight goes on, you get more power and more crit damage. All right? It's just a nice minor. Then finally, we have the GMs. I would actually say that there's a choice in your GMs here. First, there's enchantment clouds, which you're going to ignore. This is like mass boon removal. Um, doesn't really see play, I don't think, in any format. Maybe World vs. World? I'm not sure. Uh, next, there's Revenge Counter. Now, this is potentially good. Full Counter does additional damage, and it gives you resistance. And then you copy conditions from yourself to targets you hit. So the fact that we copy conditions from ourselves to targets we hit with Full Counter, we don't worry about too much. The fact that we gain resistance, we don't worry about too much. But the fact that this Grandmaster increases the flat damage of Full Counter by 20% is really cool. Uh, so in PvE, full counter actually hits really hard. Look at that. It's 1,413 damage before we have any might. This basically is a Grandmaster you can run if you're going to be mobbing, for better word, right? If we run in and we aggro a ton of targets here, all of these guys, and we know that we're going to be in quite a big AoE scenario, this is where revenge counter is really fun. Because when it procs, you saw like we did 7k damage to each target there at the start of the fight without really having to try, all right? So if you're not against bosses much, I do think the revenge counter is a possibility. My main recommendation though, the generic standard, I'm recommending Mage Bane Tether. So this, uh, this one's AoE, this one's more single target and just generally really good. When we full counter someone or when we burst them, we can tether ourselves to our target. Uh, basically, we're going to create a chain between us and them. If we move really far away from them, the chain breaks and they get pulled to us. But we don't really worry about that in PvE. You can maybe do that to break a break bar. But in general, we want that chain on them. While the chain is up, we are constantly gaining might. Now, that's three stacks of might for almost 10 seconds, the way I'm currently set up, right? Last for ages. That keeps pulsing. It keeps reveal on them. But then also, it increases our damage to the target by 10%. So the best way for me to show you this is to literally show you this, right? We're going to go up to the uh, Dust Mite, use some Axe Attacks to get the Adrenaline. Okay, uh, he's going to die too quick. we gotta, we got to find something that doesn't die too quick. That's always a problem with these. All right, so look, I'm going to Eviscerate. That's going to create this golden chain. Do you see the golden chain? And if you look at my Mite right now, it's just going to be like at 25. Just all on its own, just happily tons and tons and tons of might, all right? Not only do I get ma almost max might just from the chain, but while the chain's up, I get another flat 10% damage on my target. So, as you can see, that is just wild. Uh, being able to sustain that much might means that that's good even in AoE scenarios, because now all the things that I'm accidentally cleaving are also taking massive damage too. So, the Mage Bane Tether already is ludicrous, and you're going to see how that gets augmented with one of our other lines in a second. So, Mage Bane Tether is uh, very, very, very strong. It's one of my biggest recommendations. And, uh, you know, it will carry you through, you through so much content. Warrior is really the king of might in a lot of ways. And, well, there you have it. So, that's the Mage Bane Tether. But where does Warrior play with might most? Well, with the strength line. So, let's check out strength. Uh, first of all, we get Reckless Dodger. So, now whenever we dodge on someone, we do damage. And it's big damage, by the way. If you ever read over a 1,000 on a tooltip, it's big damage. And we're looking at that there. Next, we can take Peak Performance. This reduces physical skill recharge and also means after we use a physical skill, we get another 20% damage modifier. So you see all these modifiers start rolling in here uh, and that's how we're just blowing everything up. So uh, a physical skill is like mending if you took that, which I recommended, but we are also using bull's charge for all those reasons I already uh, showed and stomp. If we use any of these, we get this buff here, you see, which is just lingering me. All the damage I would be doing while that buff is there we would get extra. I wouldn't worry too much about like trying to chain that up. One thing you can definitely do is you can use say Bulls Rush or Stomp, then swap to your Axe set and use Axe 4-5, which means that these really big spikes tools have peak performance on them while they go. And they're going to land probably because these are hard CCs, right? So Bulls Rush stuns and gives you a massive damage modifier. And then the stun allows you to land all the damage. So, you know, it's just everything you could want all at once. So that's something you can consider. But in general, you're just going to be in a flow of uh, hitting your buttons at a certain route. Um, but yeah, peak performance, very, very strong. The other two are okay. 
Uh, there's a Berserker variant that I quite like the idea of using Brave Stride for auto headbutt opens, but we're going to go with peak performance here. Uh, next, our burst skills give us endurance, which is always nice. It's going to help us dodge. Uh, next, I'm going to take Forceful Greatsword. So, this is a Greatsword trait, right, which reduces our Greatsword cooldowns and it gives us power while we have a Greatsword. But we don't use Greatsword on this build. Now, don't get me wrong. I do like Greatsword. I like the mobility it offers, and I actually even like stuff like 100 Blades, Greatsword F1. I think it's a great weapon set, and there's probably a way you can squeeze it on. But even without Greatsword, Forceful Greatsword gives us a benefit now. Because just in general, it always does this. It gives us a chance to gain might on Critical Strike, which we are always doing. So you know how that Mage Bane Tether didn't quite finish our might out? And, you know, the Mage Bane Tether does have a cooldown as well for what worth. So sometimes there won't be a Tether up. Maybe you kill... Maybe I Tether this guy and kill it, and now the Tether's gone instantly, right? Well, that last little bit of might we get from Forceful Greatsword. Forceful Greatsword means as I Axe Auto Attack here, and as I crit with the Axe, I'm building might. I haven't Tethered anyone, but I'm up to 17 might for a second there, right? So this is, like, a big thing for our might, basically. And that's why we're going to be running that. Uh, the other two traits are okay, but nowhere near as good as this one. Uh, I do actually quite like Body Blow for what it's worth. If you combo with some of these other things, it means whenever you full counter, you're doing weakness and bleeding and cripple and slow and immobilize all on a full counter, which is kind of hilarious for break blood drain. But in general, it's not as good. Next, uh, we've got Pinnacle of Strength. Any might we have is now stronger. So all this Mage Bane Tether might we get here is now worth even more. And then finally, uh, we do actually have a choice for the Grandmaster. The bottom one is Merciless Hammer, and we're not running Hammer, and we don't have to worry about uh, but here we get a very cool decision. We can go with Berserker's Power, or we can go with Might Makes Right. So let's talk about, and this is kind of, do you want to go really aggressive, or do you want to go really kind of uh, middle of the road and sustainy and comfortable? And my main recommendation for PvE is to go comfortable every time. All right, that's been my main mindset as we've gone forwards. So my main recommendation is Might Makes Right. We'll talk about that in a second. But if you want to do the more aggressive version, let's look at Berserker's Power. This is crazy. This gives us increased damage on everything we do after we use a burst skill. Okay? And uh, what it can do is stack up to three times. As a spellbreaker, we can only ever spend one bar of adrenaline at once. So you might think this is really bad. But the thing is, we can use our burst skills so fast that you can get to the three stacks very quickly. So remember this, attack is insight. Full counter refreshes our other burst skills. Well, what that means is if we engage a tanky target, so there's a veteran here, so let's grab the veteran. As we strike this guy, once we get our adrenaline, which is very easy to do, our signet's constantly pulsing up, our weapon swaps are given it. We'll look out with the other line in a second. So what happens here is if I eviscerate, I full counter when he attacks, and I eviscerate again, right? Pretty simple, easy little combo. I actually have all three stacks of my Berserker's power on me, easily. And then I could weapon swap, and I can skull crack, and I can full counter again, and I can do it again, and I can do it. You're always going to have this. Look at this. I have three stacks, and it's... Look at how long this is lasting. For ages, and ages, and ages. And also, our attackers inside itself is stacking up. And then finally, it will eventually roll off. So you might look at this and think, oh, that's not good on Spellbreaker. It is good on Spellbreaker. Spellbreaker can constantly use burst skills. It will get those three stacks. And when it has three stacks, that's another 20% damage modifier. Look at all of these damage modifiers. It's wild. Warrior is the king of just building these up and up and up and up. So Berserker's power is great. And I absolutely recommend Berserker's Power anywhere you feel remotely confident. If you're in vanilla, if you're in earlier story stuff, if you sort of know what you're going into, Berserker's Power will speed up your, your kills really, really substantively. Like, I'll take Berserker's Power even in the B Balthazar boss fight, right? Because I just know that I can avoid absolutely everything by just timing a, a little full counter here, there, and everywhere. Uh, by the way, full counter can sometimes miss, and you saw that a couple of times in the montage at the start, but it's pretty reliable in newer content. Some people will say that Spellbreaker is bad because... Uh, you know, as opposed to Berserker or whatever, because every time you press full counter, the enemy won't attack. And it's true that in vanilla, enemies attack so slow that it can be super annoying. But nowadays, like with that warg you just saw there, it's pretty reliable, pretty easy, that their attack rate is fast enough that you'll be okay with it. I think this gets a lot more hate in PvE than it should. Uh, it's just people think about vanilla instead of what the actual new content is. So there you go, that's Berserker's power, and it is a recommendation for me. But the main recommendation, I think, as a general all-rounder, is Might Makes Right. And this says that we gain health and endurance 
whenever we apply a mic to ourselves. So this is even more resustained. We're going to get the Hill Signet, we're going to get the Sun and Moon Style, and we're going to get Mike Mage right. What does this mean? It means when we Mage Bane tether someone, not only are we doing more damage to him, not only are we turbocharging our, um, uh, our Might, but as we just stand near him, we are constantly gaining dodges and we're resustaining. That's why you're seeing three hefty green numbers beneath my character, just constantly resustaining. Uh, any target I go against. So this basically means you can kind of face roll your way through the game, alright? Pay attention and kill things a little bit quicker or genuinely just be in a nice comfortable place where you can hit things and do well. I know that a lot of your instincts, people watching this video are going to say, oh, I don't want to run this one, but believe me, there's a very big difference between Might Makes Right and just how comfortable and natural and easy and fun Guild Wars 2 is versus if you go the more aggressive version, say here with Berserker's Power. So uh, my main recommendation is actually Might Makes Right. And so so you'll see here, all of this synergizing with the might we get from the tether is uh, is very, very, very potent. Uh, that leaves us with one more line. So I've gone with discipline here. Uh, mostly because I really love all of the extra stuff you get from discipline. But also because this build is a little bit light on adrenaline. Which discipline can round out in a really nice way for us. So let's go through. First of all, versatile rage. Whenever we weapon swap, we get 5 adrenaline. And you've actually seen that's been of benefit to me as we've been playing. If I want to uh, get all of my burst stuff ready, you know, all I have to do is put myself in combat by throwing the axe. And as soon as I'm in combat, I just weapon swap. And you see, we can basically burst already, right? The signet will push us over in a second. But then when we weapon swap again, you know, it's chunking up massively. Just this weapon swap adrenaline is really nice. It really is. So there, like, for example, you might have thought, oh, he's not going to get that full counter, but it even went through. Generally, their attack rate is set up so that you will be able to trigger this stuff fairly regularly. So, uh, yeah, versatile power is really big for your combos, okay? Because you might full counter or skull crack, which means you've spent some adrenaline. Then you weapon swap and you might want to eviscerate straight away. But you don't have the adrenaline? Well, you will with versatile power. This is actually a really good minor trait. Next, uh, we can take warrior's sprint. The other two traits are okay. Vengeful return in PvE is kind of fun, I guess. Uh, and crack shot, as I talked about earlier, maybe with uh, rifle or longbow variant, there's something going on here. But I, I generally recommend Warrior Sprint. It means you're always moving 25% faster. The game does feel a bit slow and annoying if you don't always have that on you. Um, so I like that. It means you remove immobilize when you eviscerate, and it means that you remove immobilize when you bulls rush or when you stomp. I think you, you would remove it anyway on any kind of stomp, but that's quite nice. Uh, and then in general, just 7% more damage while you have swiftness on you, which you can get very easily, very comfortably. So I do recommend this. You could even uh, basically then look at Signet of Rage, activating it as a 7% 7, 7 modifier for ages because the swiftness will last so long here. You can get swiftness from your pack runes or whatever, a sigil, a sigil of agility if that's what you've decided to run lots of ways to proc this up if you're ever near other players you're gonna be getting crazy tons of swiftness where is sprints great next fast hands you can now weapon swap faster so this again is really good because it helps you proc versatile rage more regularly and warrior just feels way more fun while you have fast hands I don't need to tell any warriors watching me out here uh, how kind of lame the game feels when you're on a non fast hands build compared to when you are it's one of the reasons I love discipline next I've got brawlers recovery now here I've actually gone with uh, a much more conservative choice. You guys are more than welcome to instead run Destruction of the Empowered. So we're not using any banners. We don't have to worry about the top trait. But Destruction of the P Empowered is do more damage to foes that have boons. And it's more damage the more boons. It's one of those things. If you're in new content, if you're against Awaken and stuff, they sustain like three boons on themselves all of the time. Well, this helps you. The thing is, you also rip a lot of boons, and you want to rip a lot of boons for attacker insights procs and stuff. So, I don't know. Uh, I'm not too sure about Destruction of the Powder. It seems like it might be okay. In general, I like Brawler's Recovery because it allows you to cleanse when you weapon swap. And that means so much in a world where, okay, I finished the fight, but I have a little bit of lingering poison, and I want to get on my mount. Well, now all I have to do is hit my weapon swap bind. The poison is gone, and I can break combat and mount up. I'm always really annoyed if I don't have just that little way of cleansing on demand. This is it. And this uh, just smooths out the experience for me so much. Uh, next, we have versatile power. We get might whenever we weapon swap, which gives us our might makes right and all that kind of other stuff, which is very good. Also, burst skills have reduced recharge. This actually isn't as great as it might look. It does actually reduce the full counter 
cooldown, which is kind of cool. But uh, because our main bursts are getting refreshed by full counter itself so regularly, this kind of a, a, a little bit, this is a little bit irrelevant. But the faster full counters is, of course, very, very nice. And then finally, the Grand Master. Now, Burst Mastery looks good. I know it's increased damage and it's more adrenaline for you. High and Focus looks good. It's extra quickness for you. And you do have some quickness in the build, but you could use a little bit more. But I actually find Axe Mastery is far and away the best. We have this set up that we have an axe on both weapon sets, right? On this set, I have an axe on my offhand. On this, I have an axe on my main hand. So our Grandmaster for axes is always working. And what is it? It's gain ferocity, gain additional ferocity for each axe I'm wielding. We don't get the additional ferocity because at any point, we're only wielding one axe, right? We would have we would have 240 ferocity if we wielded both at the same time. But we're wielding one at a time, right? But it's extra crit damage. It's 120 extra crit damage. It's reduced cooldown on our axe skills, which is especially powerful on these two, the Jewel Strike and the Whirling Axe. But then, I mean, it's even good, to be honest, on the Cyclone Axe and on Eviscerate. But then, even better, we have uh, Adrenaline whenever we crit with an axe, which we will be doing a ton of, and that is where a lot of our Adrenaline comes from. If we're not running Axe Marsh, and if we're not, you know, getting a little bit from Versatile Rage and stuff... It is pretty slow on the adrenaline on this build, so I really think this rounds it out massively and it kind of enables you to start using these skills, which turbocharges everything else, keeps the tethers going and whatnot, and there you have it. So that's the way that I like to play Spellbreaker. That's the way that I've built it. There are definitely are some options out there. Uh, I think Warrior is one of the most um, versatile characters and builds out in the game. There's definitely an interesting way of doing Berserker, which maybe we can look at at a later date. But this is my preferred, my favorite, my main way of going through the game. It's just very comfortable, very good flow. I cannot imagine, and I sincerely believe this, as the Ice Brood Saga is about to begin, I cannot imagine ArenaNet adding any content over the next two years that this exact build will ever struggle with. I, I just can't. So, there you have it, guys. Let me know what you think. Thanks very much. And if I can figure out how the new build templates and stuff work, in the description, you should hopefully find a code, and you can just load that in straight away. That'd be pretty cool. So, uh, yeah, thanks, guys. There's only two more builds left for the series. That's going to be the Ranger and the Reaper. It's your guess as to what's next. Cheers, everyone. Take care, and I'll see you shortly.